too far. We can move. Yeah, of course. <laughs> You ready? You can check that. I think Jen is about one minute outside. Okay, we can start. Okay, good afternoon. Happy Wednesday. On today's stated agenda, the council will be voting on the following uh, legislation out of the Finance Committee. The council will vote on introduction 1750 to authorize six business improvement districts across the city to increase the amount that they're authorized to assess. We'll also be voting on the following property tax exemptions, Knickerbock Vill Knickerbocker Village and Councilmember Chin's district, Strivers Plaza and Councilmember Perkins's district, St. Nicholas Manor Apartments in Councilmember Perkins's district. And moving on, the council will vote on the following pieces of legislation. Introduction 1541B, sponsored by myself, would create a specialized high school task force that would be charged with addressing the racial and ethnic student body inequities of specialized high schools. I'm really proud of this bill. We're the most diverse city in the country, but our specialized high schools do not reflect that, and I think that's disgraceful and something that all of us should be working to address. This bill does that with a task force made up with speaker and mayoral appointees that would be required to examine three things. The first, the current admission system, including the specialized high school admissions exam and whether such exams should be changed or eliminated. Two, existing programs such as the Department of Education's Discovery and Dream programs. And three, the use of alternative, alternative admissions methods, including state standardized examinations and grade point average. Next, the council will vote on several bills and resolutions that will strengthen our existing animal welfare laws. Uh, over the last decade, New York City has proven itself to be one of the most progressive cities in the country on issues relating to animal welfare, and I'm happy we're advancing these bills so we can stay that way for decades to come. Pre-considered resolution 977, sponsored by Council Member uh, Robert Holden, would call on the United States Congress to pass and the President to sign H.R. 724 and Senate Bill 479, the Preventing Animal Cruelty Torture Act, otherwise known as PACT, and I don't see Councilmember Holden here. Next is resolution 921, sponsored by Majority Leader Lori Cumbo, which calls on the New York State Legislature to pass and the Governor to sign Assembly Bill 286, which would provide a tax credit to each taxpayer who adopts a household pet from a shelter. I adopted my cat, Moose, from a shelter. Come on up. Thank you, Speaker Corey Johnson. According to the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, millions in dogs and cats are euthanized in animal shelters across the country every year because they have not been adopted into loving homes. In New York City, there is a great need to encourage more people to adopt dogs and cats from animal shelters. Animal Care Center of New York City is a not-for-profit rescue organization in New York City under contract with the city with a mission to end animal homelessness in New York City. ACC is an open admission shelter, meaning the organization will accept any animal regardless of breed or species. ACC is the largest pet organization in the Northeast and had an adjusted total intake of 21,514 animals in 2018. The cost of adopting a dog or cat can be burdensome for many families and may prevent some people willing to open their homes to a shelter for a dog or cat. This tax credit will help to bridge that gap for so many families. Encouraging New Yorkers to adopt pets is not only compassionate, but would also reduce the stress on resources of the shelters that house and care for adoptable <coughs> animals. I also want to add that owning a pet has important health and social benefits for the pet owner. You see Corey Johnson here, how healthy he is. Several studies funded by the National Institute for Health have demonstrated that pet ownership can improve cardiovascular health, he loves me more, lead to lower heart rate and blood pressure, increase the amount of exercise people get, and help people make and keep social connections. So I just want to thank all of my colleagues. This is really important for both the animals as well as us, and I thank you, Speaker Corey Johnson, for your leadership and by leading for, by example by adopting moose. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so glad you're here today, Madam Majority Leader. Uh, next is Resolution 379, sponsored by Councilmember Helen Rosenthal, and it calls for the recognition, recognition of Meatless Mondays in New York City. Uh, next is Introduction 1570A, sponsored by Councilmember Mark Levine. Uh, let me call up Helen first. I just called you up. Oh, look I'm at just, that. Meatless Mondays. Hi. So thank you, Speaker Johnson. 
Um, so our choices really matter, and our choices can even be delicious. My resolution encourages New Yorkers to enjoy Meatless Mondays so that all of us can take part in the long-lasting benefits of a plant-based diet, reduce risk of a wide range of diseases, improved overall health, and longer lives. Just one example, a recent study has confirmed that persons who follow a plant-based diet have a substantially lower risk for heart disease, and heart disease is the leading cause of death for both men and women in the United States. If good health isn't good enough, consider this. Every year we raise nearly a billion cattle, billions of pigs and ducks, and tens of billions of chickens. Consider the workers in the meat industry um, their conditions range from, uh, I would say, onerous to brutal. Raising and feeding billions of animals requires deforestation of land across the globe and huge quantities of water. The animals live in often deplorable conditions and produce staggering amounts of waste that poisons our water sources and soil. They also produce methane, a greenhouse, a greenhouse gas. Indeed, according to the UN, agriculture, forestry, and other land uses now account for nearly a quarter of greenhouse gases. There's something for everyone when it comes to a plant-based diet. I am delighted that the council is voting on this resolution today. I want to thank my co-sponsors, council members Cabrera, Brandon, Salamanca, Combo, Powers, and Ulrich. Thank you so much, speaker. Thanks, thanks Helen. Thank you, Helen. Uh, next, introduction 1578, sponsored by Councilmember Mark Levine, which would ensure that dogs entering kennels, businesses, or establishments need to be in compliance with the New York City Health Code, which requires the dog be vaccinated for Bordetella, and I want to invite him to come speak on this bill. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. And um, if it's okay, just a minute on this incredible package that we passed out of the Health Committee yesterday related to animal welfare, seven bills. Um, I'm really proud of the way this council and, and Speaker Johnson have um, prioritized animal welfare. Um, and we passed some really consequential bills yesterday. Um, we weighed very heavily the business impact of every one of those bills, as we always do, something we deliberated intensely about. Um, but we also believe, as I said yesterday, that as society evolves, we have a right to ask that business evolve. And that's what we're doing here in, in smart, fair, measured ways. Um, and I'm really proud of, of the sponsors of this package, some of whom are here, Councilmember Rosenthal, Councilmember Brannon. Um, and I'm just going to speak on one uh, item in that package, um, which is decidedly not one of the monumental bills we're passing today, but nonetheless is important. It's part of our years-long fight to improve our shelter system, where there's a high incidence of kennel cough, which is the canine version of whooping cough. It's very serious. It's contagious. It can be deadly. And it can be prevented with a Bordadella vaccination. Um, we have all sorts of inconsistencies now in the health code uh, related to this, and that needs to be fixed. So this bill, uh, intro 1570, establishes clearly, consistently, that uh, dogs entering the shelter system and other business establishments have to have this vaccination uh, to keep them healthy. And I'm really pleased that we're voting on this bill and this entire package today. Thank you, Mr. Thanks, Speaker. Mark. You did a great job getting these bills through committee, so thank you. Uh, next is introduction 1498A, sponsored by Councilmember Fernando Cabrera, which would require that the New York City Police uh, Department publish semi-annual reports on complaints uh, on investigations of animal cruelty allegations. Specifically, the department would report on the number of animal cruelty complaints received and arrests that happened. 
Uh, Councilmember Cabrera is not here. Next is introduction 870A, sponsored by Councilmember Joe Borelli, which would require any full service animal shelter operated by New York City to post photographs of each adoptable animal within three days of receiving such animal, provided that the animal is medically and behaviorally well enough. It would require the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to encourage non full service animal shelters to promote the placement of adoptable animals. Next is resolution 798, sponsored by council member Justin Brannon, which calls on the New York State Legislature to pass and the governor to sign uh, assembly and Senate bills, uh, which would amend the agriculture and markets law and the general business law in relation to a uh, sale of cats, dogs, and rabbits. And he has another bill as well. He can speak on both. Introduction 1470A uh, would establish the Office of Animal Welfare, headed by a director appointed by the mayor. The office would be vested with the power to advise and assist the mayor in the coordination and cooperation between agencies relating to animal welfare administration, regulation, management, and programs. It'd also be charged with reviewing rec and recommending budget priorities relating to animal welfare, preparing an annual animal welfare report and serving as a liaison for the city regarding animal welfare. And finally, the office will provide outreach and education on animal welfare programs and the humane treatment of animals and perform other duties that the mayor may assign to protect animals in New York City. So I invite Councilor Brandon to speak on these two important bills. One reso and one vote. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, this is something, this is a very, very big day. As someone who um, got his start as a punk rock teenage animal rights advocate, um, and now I'm here at City Hall wearing a suit. Um, it's a very, very big day, and this is something that Corey, the speaker, and I have been talking about before I was even an elected official, about moving in this direction and, and the city really trying to lead, uh, getting back to the, to the front of the pack, if you will, and trying to lead on animal issues because we felt that so many other cities, frankly, were eating our lunch when it came to this stuff. So today is really planting our flag in the ground with all of these bills. Um, to show that animal welfare is important and we're codifying stuff so that no matter who is in City Hall, uh, that this stuff will remain important. Um, so today is one small step for man, but one giant leap for animal kind. Thank you. Right. Next is uh, introduction 1425A, sponsored by Councilmember Keith Powers, which would prohibit carriage horses from being worked when the air temperature is 90 degrees Fahrenheit or above, or whenever the air temperature is 80 degrees Fahrenheit or above, and the equine heat index is 150 or above. And we have two final pieces of legislation regarding animal welfare. Uh, Councilmember Powers is not here. Um, but the next two pieces are uh, two by Councilmember Carlina Rivera. The first is introduction 1378, which would prohibit retail food establishments or restaurants from storing, maintaining, selling, or offering to sell force-fed products or food containing a force-fed product. The bill creates a rebuttable presumption that any item with a label or listed on the menu as foie gras is the product of force feeding. Violators would be subject to a civil penalty between $500 and $2,000 per offense. And the next bill is introduction 1202A, also sponsored by Councilmember Rivera, which would prohibit non-exempt individuals from taking or attempting to take any wild bird. Exempt individuals include law enforcement employees or other city employees acting in the scope of their duties, a person authorized by law or permit, or a person attempting to rescue a wild bird. Any person who unlawfully takes a bird is subject to a misdemeanor and a fine of more than $1,000 because people have been uh, trapping uh, birds in New York City with nets and scooping them up and bringing them to Pennsylvania and then and using them uh, to shoot on ranges. So I invite Council Rivera to come and speak on these two bills. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Uh, congratulations to my colleagues. I guess I'll start with 1202. Uh, a lot of our legislation comes from ideas and experiences by our constituents. And this one is, is clearly an example of constituent calls that we would receive of people witnessing uh, birds on, on the ground, on our streets, being kind of lured with seed and then netted and taken somewhere to be shot for live sport. It is already illegal to take animals off the street in New York City. We are making sure that we're bringing awareness to this issue and that poaching or trafficking is something that we will not tolerate here in New York City. It also leads me to my next bill, which is really to make sure that we are putting forward legislation that 
brings us to a point where we can move towards being a more humane city. We were the first state to enact anti-animal cruelty legislation, and we want to continue to be a leader in this country and that we are staying at the forefront of this movement. It has been decades and centuries that animal activists have been fighting to make sure that we are treating animals with dignity and respect. And this bill uh, on foie gras is something that um, I am very, very uh, honored to carry. I worked on animal rights legislation under my predecessor when we banned exotic animals for entertainment and knowing the people that are working to make sure that we are again passing responsible balanced legislation as Councilmember Levine pointed out making sure that we are talking to stakeholders and understanding economic impact but always moving forward and trying to be a more humane city. So we're excited to be voting on this bill, particularly after amending the bill to ensure farmers, restaurants, and other purchasers have a th three-year phase-in period to adapt their business practices before the ban goes into effect. I believe that with this amendment, these farms, which produce a wide variety of other duck products that they can continue to sell and that already make up a large portion of their sales, will have sufficient time to adapt to ensure the products they sell in New York are humane. In addition, farms can build out their business opportunities in the 48 and a half other states where foie gras is still legal. This phase in is a sufficient compromise, particularly when you consider they're already turning down opportunities for sales and that other culinary capitals across the <coughs> world who have banned foie gras, Germany, states like California, they are, they, those businesses are booming and they're doing very well. So if these farms, which purport to use the most sustainable practices in the business, want to continue selling in New York City, I would also encourage them to pursue other methods of foie gras production, such as those done by farmers in Spain that do not involve gavage. This is about force feeding, which is an inhumane practice that cannot be allowed to continue. We have bipartisan support for this bill with 30 sponsors. And I want to just say to all of my colleagues and, and all of the advocates, I am very, very thankful. Foie gras is far from the only cuisine subjected to bans. And as I work on this legislation and many more, I realize that we are very, very capable of passing animal rights legislation at the same time as we pass historic bills on commercial waste and looking at how we plan the future of our city streets. So we're a diverse body, we have diverse legislation, and this animal package, which is historic and important to me, and many of the advocates here, I'm thankful, and I'm excited for the vote today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Carlina. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have a series of bills aimed at transforming and regulating the commercial waste industry. Uh, this package includes legislation to regulate the private carting industry, including introduction 1574A, sponsored by Councilmember Antonio Reynoso, who's the chair of our sanitation committee, and it authorizes the creation of commercial waste zones. For too long, the private carting industry has been able to operate without adequate safeguards to ensure air quality and street safety. Private carters have customers throughout the city, resulting in long, inefficient routes and millions of excess truck miles driven every single year. Waste hauling vehicles are needlessly driving through our communities, increasing air pollution that negatively impact public health and that emit greenhouse gas emissions that contribute to our current climate crisis. The creation of commercial waste zones will result in shorter, more efficient routes, eliminating more than 18 million miles of truck traffic from New York City streets. Not only will this dramatically reduce the environmental harms of this industry, but drivers will no longer be incentivized to drive unsafely to complete their routes. Drivers can go slower and they can be more alert and the workers and public will be safer. This reform will also incentivize better recycling practices, increased organics processing, and a transition to zero emission vehicles. We have worked diligently to engage with stakeholders throughout this process, and we have, cre we have created an ambitious, achievable reform. Today, I am proud we will vote to make our air cleaner, our streets safer, and provide businesses throughout the city more transparent pricing and better services. So introduction 1574A, sponsored by Councilman Reynoso, would mandate the establishment of commercial waste zones. The Department of Sanitation would designate commercial waste zones and enter into agreements with up to three private carters to operate in each zone. The next bill by Councilman Reynoso is introduction 1573. 
And this is a bill at the request of the mayor, which would add enforcement of environmental safety and health standards to the powers and duties of BIC, the Business Integrity Commission. This clear statement of BIC's authority to act on unsafe practices in this industry would allow the agency to consider a business's practices more broadly upon license renewal. Before I call up uh, the chair who works so hard on this, I just want to say he has done a tremendous job. He has been working on this for uh, years now. This is his second term chairing the uh, sanitation committee. Last year together, we worked on uh, a bill which had languished for almost a dozen years on waste transfer facilities throughout New York City and their capacity and the disproportionate impact they were having on communities of color in the South Bronx in North Brooklyn and in Southeast Queens. And right when that finished, we said together we were gonna get to work on this because this is the next step in doing the right thing for communities across New York City that have suffered from uh, environmental injustice. And so um, I'm really proud of him. I'm proud of the job he's done. This has not been easy. It's been difficult. The bill has changed and he's handled it in a very thoughtful, professional, and uh, I think a really, really appropriate way to get this bill done. So I want to call him up and congratulate him. And are you feeling okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, I, okay. I want to call up Councilman Moreno, so. All right. Um, <clears throat> I think that the new lights are really, really strong. Um, first, I just want to thank uh, Speaker Corey Johnson. When I, when I started my term, the second term, he sat down with me and asked me what was important to me. After I was done laying out you know, the millions of things I wanted to do, he said, if it's important to you, it's important to me. And he knew this was my top priority. It was passing waste equity and then passing waste, um, waste zones. And then in no time, um, after years of work actually, six years of putting in the work to make this happen, we got it done. So I just really want to thank Corey for following through and for believing that um, our, our intentions were actually about um, making the city a better place. Um, I have a, a statement that I'm not gonna read because I'm gonna read it um, at stated. But I wanna speak about uh, my story. Uh, I was uh, a, a young brown boy from the south side of Winnesburg uh, who you could call, uh, when it comes to environmental injustice, the Newtown Creek is polluted. We have three times the asthma rates or the asthma entrance walking into Woodhall Hospital than the city average. We have a BQE that guts through the middle of our neighborhood. Our parks are almost exclusively on either side of the BQE, meaning when our kids are running around and jumping and having a good time, they're sucking in those fumes as well. We have 40% of the city's trash was handled in our district before waste equity. Um, and then of those trucks that are in, we have huge issues. Uh, so I set out to never thinking that, you know, through destiny or fate, that I would be able to stand here and affect meaningful change to my community. Uh, and today I'm standing here feeling that as chair of the sanitation committee, that I was able to make that happen. Uh, the waste zone legislation was very difficult to do. Many people on many sides. Uh, this is a piece of legislation that handles environmental justice issues, workers' rights issues, and street safety issues all in one. To bring those type of coalitions together is very difficult, but we are able to do it and accomplish that today. And I wanna specifically today thank um, the staff, uh, I'm gonna name them all. Nicola Bean, Nadia Johnson, John Seltzer, Megan Chen, Brad Reed, Terza Nasser, Jeff Baker, who worked tirelessly on this 60 page bill. This is not two, three, four pages. Uh, but there were two people, everyone works very hard in this council, but there were two people that were working um, weekends, late nights. I was changing the legislation left and right. There were people throwing stuff in, people taking things out. It was I just know. madness. I know. <laughs> and there was two weeks specifically where they were, it, was, it was really, really madness. And um, they did that work uh, late night and weekends. And I just want to give them a gift. Um, I, I checked this out. It's, it's all we clear. It's okay with the yeah. <laughs> yes. These are, these are two uh, electric, electric garbage trucks that I want to give to Nicole and Nadia to please come up and pick them up. Um, <laughs> They're electric because they're battery powered. Um, <laughs> so I want you to take this. Thank you so much. Um, a lot of people don't know the amount of work the back of the staff does when it comes to writing this legislation and helping make sure that everyone's opinions are, are taken into account. Remember, they're just writing this and they got a lot of heat. Uh, when all they're doing is their job. And I just really appreciate the work that they do in my committee. Um, thank you all, and I'm looking forward to 
to passing this bill. Thank congratulations. you. Thank congratulations. You. Congratulations, Antonio. The staff here is the best, and uh, Nadia and Nicole and their whole team did an amazing, amazing job. I'm so grateful for your work. Next is introduction 1082A, sponsored by Councilmember Rafael Salamanca, which would require GPS systems on waste hauling vehicles that are used to collect waste in commercial zones. And Councilmember Salamanca has another bill, introduction 1083, which would require a minimum fine of $1,000 and a maximum fine of $10,000 for carding companies that receive a violation for an unreported employee. Councilmember Salamanca is not here. And finally, the council will be voting on my streets master plan legislation today. I want to thank each and every council member and staff member who has been involved in this process. I want to thank the advocates who have helped push this issue into the forefront of our city over the past few years, Families for Safe Streets, the Riders Alliance, Transportation Alternatives, uh, Bike New York, Streets Pack, and uh, there are two people I want to specifically uh, thank, though a lot of people have worked on this. I want to thank Rob Newman and Kelly Taylor for their incredible, incredible hard work on getting this done, how thoughtful, how diligent, how thorough they've been throughout this entire process. They're the ones that helped uh, really come up with this idea as part of the state of the city earlier this year and have really seen it through basically from January until today. So I'm really grateful, Rob and Kelly, for your hard work and help on this. We have lost too many people over the years due to traffic violence. Sometimes it's hard to even process because the loss of life is so great. So today I will just talk about one, just one of the thousands and thousands of New Yorkers that have been killed because of traffic violence. Seth Kahn was 22 years old when he was hit by an MTA bus in Hell's Kitchen in my district in 2009, 10 years ago. His father, Harold Kahn, spoke movingly about the importance of this bill yesterday at the press conference we had. He described his only child as a, quote, joy to be around, who was handsome, kind, generous, loving, creative, and talented. 10 years after Seth's death, Harold and his wife, Debbie, miss hearing their son's stories and they're heartbroken that they'll never be grandparents. When we vote on this bill today, I'd like us to remember the reason why safe streets are so necessary and why bold action is needed. I am proud of this bill, but I know there is so much more work that we have to do, and I am committed to doing that work. Introduction 1557A, and I want to thank the chair of our Transportation Committee for his leadership, hard work, help, hearing this, and everything he's done on making our streets safer. This bill would require the Department of Transportation to issue and implement a transportation master plan every five years. The plan's goals would be to prioritize the safety of all street users, the use of mass transit, the reduction of vehicle emissions, and access for individuals with disabilities. Each plan would include certain benchmarks. The first plan would be due in December of 2021. The bill also requires reporting in February of each year regarding update of any changes to the master plan and the progress towards achieving the benchmarks laid out in the plan. The New York City Department of Transportation would be required to conduct a public education campaign on the benefits of each master plan. That's the bill. I'm really proud of it, and I look forward to proceeding with today's votes. I'm happy to start uh, with any on-topic questions. Any on-topic? Uh, yeah, Joe. Um, on the Winston bill, it seems like the, the bill places a lot of the regu regulatory authority in uh, transportation. Could you explain you know, what role the business integrity commission has in regulating that is not, you know, that transportation doesn't have? And, you know, why, why does the agency still have the, the GI Bill of authority? I'll let Antonio start. Yeah, so uh, the, the RFP and the implementation of the commercial waste zones is going to happen through DSNY, so they're going to be ensuring that the, uh, the companies that do get these contracts uh, play by the rules um, under which they were contracted to, to work under by the city of New York. BIC, on the other hand, currently um, doesn't, have necessar uh, doesn't have authority, for example, to, to uh, investigate like safety issues. They do go after corruption um, and organized uh, crime within the industry, but they don't go after safety. Now they're going to be able to look into safety as one, or one of the, 
the authorities that they're going to have is to look into safety um, and and hold companies accountable. Therefore, after that, should they not be a safe company or a company that's uh, uh, violating rules that they are now authorized to enforce, um, the Department of Sanitation can take that information and remove a carter from uh, a contract or remove them from a zone. So um, there are two different two different aspects of it. The work that BIC does is going to be able to be enforced actually by DSNY. They do investigate safety, but I think um, in in this case, they're going to be able to look at the work that BIC is doing for safety specifically, um, in the work that they're doing to um, in enforce their the the carton company's contracts. Uh, but uh, and I want to I don't want to misspeak, but uh, I do the authority that they're being given is not something that currently is done by DSNY. And I'll get I'll be clear on that when I vote on this as well. Uh, Sean? So the latest reports from the station is you made three this morning. Of course, there is driver drove all the way downtown, I think, ended up at Rockland Park to protest the bill, which of course violates the ban on carrying this out for a certain floor of two. Uh, what do you think should be done over that? There needs to be, the, yes, there needs to be enforcement. The people need to abide by the rules. The rules are put in place. They're not allowed to go south 34th Street. They shouldn't have brought the horse carriage down here. Will? Will, I'm not going to play gotcha question time. You know, I, I, I take, no, no, no it's, it's not, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a simple question. I take the subway all the time. I took the bus across 14th Street last Friday. Uh, there, I do use a car, and I haven't told anyone they have to ditch their car. I haven't told New Yorkers they have to get rid of their car. I've said that we need to make our streets safer for everyone. And that is what this is about. It's about planning safe streets. It's about doing the improvements, not in a piecemeal way, but a way that works for the entire city. Uh, Juan Manuel. I don't support banning uh, the horses from New York City. Uh, I think that we can come up with regulations that make it safer, and that's what this bill is about today. But no, I, don't, I didn't support the ban when it came up uh, in the previous council when I was first elected, but I support improving the industry, and I think this bill accomplishes that. Uh, Yoav? Um, uh, one minute plus Carlo Monte. Okay. Now. Yes. I don't believe they're supportive of this bill, um, but I support the bill. I don't sponsor a lot of legislation that I support. A lot of the bills today we're voting on, I'm not a sponsor on, but I support them. Um, and I look forward to getting this bill done um, hopefully soon. We've continued to try to negotiate in good faith. We've worked with the advocates. We've worked with uh, Chair Salamanca. And I think we need to do this because of the homelessness crisis that our city's facing. But is it the end goal to get it to, to have enough sponsors to be approved? I want it to have as much support as possible uh, before we go into a vote. I think that's important. Uh, Alex? Yeah. So I have a question on the actual board. The board. Yes. No. No, I think one of the big problems with how the uh, proposal was rolled out earlier this year on the SHSAT elimination was that there wasn't enough community input, there wasn't enough consultation, and so you had certain communities 
in some instance, the, the Asian American community here in New York City didn't feel like they were consulted or brought into the process before the decision was made. So the goal of this is to actually have a diverse set of viewpoints. I don't, uh, I think we should have multiple measures. I think you could have a test, but you also should look at grade point average, class rank, a variety of other things. But I want the task force to be made up of people with all different types of beliefs, and hopefully there can be consensus on areas of agreement. There may not be a total consensus on everything, but I think it's important to have people that even don't agree with me or don't agree with the mayor's proposal as part of the task force. So that is not the goal of this. The goal is to actually create consensus and buy-in uh, by doing the outreach that wasn't done before the plan was unveiled before. Gloria? We've been negotiating in good faith. You know, there was a change in deputy mayors when Deputy Mayor Glenn left and Deputy Mayor Bean started, and we started to have conversations. We've continued to have conversations with Deputy Mayor Bean and her team, um, as well as the mayor's team. I support this bill. Uh, I've met with the advocates. I was on the steps today, um, and the bill will move, uh, but I want to continue to have conversations internally here in the council with members, as well as let the staff continue to negotiate while those conversations are happening with the administration. Can I ask about the charge? Uh, there yes. Was part of what the um, So the, the yeah, and, and the first question is, at the moment, BIC never had the authority to use safety as a, as a precursor on whether or not you get a license in the city of New York. Um, so you could be a terrible company and still get a license under the city of New York. Uh, I got a permit. Now you can actually lose your permit. Um, they could take safety into consideration. Um, and when you get that permit, then you can start applying or be eligible to be in the commercial waste zone system. Um, the, big, the problem with BIC is that it would have been an incremental change into, in the work that we're doing. Uh, if the, meals, the vehicle miles reduction would have been um, exactly the same. Uh, we would have given them more safety concerns, so there would have been more violations to the, to the industry, but for the most part would have kept it intact, almost doing business as usual. The way zoning legislation uh, completely changes the way we do work in the city of New York in the private sanitation industry. So I didn't want to do something that was half-stepped. Uh, I always, uh, you know, hold the mayor accountable for not being bold. In this case, we were being bold. We were actually changing it in a meaningful way, um, and we wanted to make sure that that's the legacy we left. Um, so it's versus, uh, small changes versus big changes. Uh, Vin? Um, <coughs> So Local 108 has been in opposition to this from the very beginning. They've, uh, they ha they've been obstructionists through this whole process. So I want to be very clear and start by saying that. I don't think that any form of this bill would have been acceptable to them. And when I start building out legislation, I'm trying to get as many people to the table and modify a bill that works for as many people as possible. They just didn't want to be at the table. The race to the bottom. Um, the entire system that we're creating was an, uh, a response to the race to the bottom. What we're saying is that there are about uh, 80 to 90 companies that do this work currently in the city of New York. Many of them have very old trucks, pay workers very little, um, run through the streets and get many violations for how they're moving, how they're moving about in our streets, don't recycle, many standards that they're just ignoring. Um, those people don't deserve to be doing business in the city of New York. Through an RFP system, we're going to be electing or we're going to be choosing the best carters to do this work. The best carters have new equipment, they have infrastructure, they pay their workers well, um, and in doing so, have higher expenses when it comes to what it costs to pick up trash. I'll give one quick example, sanitation salvage. Once it was shut down after the death of Mokhtar Diallo, um, these, uh, what I call legitimate businesses, went in, 
to try to take on their, their business. They couldn't because the prices that they were offering these businesses were, were so low that they didn't cover operation expenses um, in, their, in their business. So what we have to do is eliminate those, uh, what I call bottom feeders and race to the bottom folks, to allow for the folks that are doing a good job, the businesses that are doing a good job, to be able to make it in this market. Uh, and I have given the authority to the, the, the Department of Sanitation to set a minimum. What, they, what the laborers wanted was to make the maximum the minimum which would have doubled the cost of businesses right off the bat, would have doubled the cost of businesses um, in the city of New York. Right now, on average, it's 10 to $13, let's say, uh, I think it's a yard, 10 to $13 a yard. They're asking for that to be 23 to $26 a yard. That means that when we write this bill, we would have been telling the businesses that we are going to double the cost of your trash pickup. I want to allow for the RFPs to kind of dictate what that price is going to be, and I think we could get justice without um, uh, leaning on businesses to pay double what they're paying now. So I disagreed with them on that, and that's their contention. Oh, sorry, one more thing that's very important. Increasing the prices from 13 or 10 to 26 or $23 does not guarantee that that money will go to workers. We can't do that in this legislation. We're preempted. So by law, we could have doubled their, the amount of money that these companies are making, and they could have all gone to their pockets and not gone into new equipment or workers and so forth. Bridget? Sure. Well, I, I think I understand uh, that people might be a little task forced out, you know, that, you know, people have sort of task force fatigue. But given the uh, critical importance of this and how polarizing it has been from Alex's question, you know, before, it's really about hopefully finding areas of consensus because the way this was initially rolled out, it immediately polarized the debate where you were on one side or the other and it drew lines in the sand. And I think that's why you saw a little more than a month ago the mayor back away from his proposal in Albany and to say that he was not seeking to reintroduce the bill that uh, Assemblymember Barron had introduced because he thought there needed to be further conversations. This sort of sets the stage to have those conversations, to have a diverse set of viewpoints, people that uh, support the mayor's plan, people that oppose the mayor's plan, people that support parts of the mayor's plan, oppose parts of the mayor's plan, to all sit around together and start to have that conversation. And what was your other one? And then on your, on your yeah. Uh, we are still going to push for a lot of these street improvements to be made uh, before 2021, but the reason why it got delayed was because you heard at the hearing when the Department of Transportation testified on this bill in May or June that uh, to actually carry out this master plan after the master plan comes out, once you actually have to operationalize it and start to do the street improvements, it's going to take a total reshaping of DOT. I mean, DOT is going to have to change significantly. They're going to have to build new facilities. They're going to have to hire a lot more staff. They're going to have to operationalize this by expanding their current bandwidth to actually build the bike lanes, build the bus lanes, do the pedestrianization, do the transit signal priority, do all of those things. We thought that they made a point, which was if you had the plan come out a year from now and basically go into effect a year from now, in that first year of it going into effect, they were not going to be able to meet the benchmarks. They would not be able to operationalize this and get up to speed in time to carry this out. So instead, we gave them an additional year to come up with the master plan and then to have it go into effect with 30 miles of protected bike lane in the first year in 2022, 50 miles in the four years uh, after that, 30 miles of bus lane in those years. But you already heard from the mayor about two months ago, his green wave plan for cyclists, which was 30 miles of protected bike lanes for cyclists across New York City. So they're already gonna be doing that <coughs> this year and next year before this plan goes into effect. 
So because they were already gonna do that work, because the MTA has been working to improve bus routes around New York City with the busway, a combination of those two things and the need to totally reshape and reorient the agency and build up that capacity, that's why I was okay with giving them a little extra time to be able to come up with the plan and be able to actually carry it out once it's done. You know, I mean, I have, I think, pushed the envelope more than this administration has on these issues, on our streets, uh, on pushing for municipal control of our subway system, on um, supporting a variety of bills that, you know, came from the council and came from advocates. Um, but I still think they have uh, holistically uh, tried to do some good on here. You know, the mayor came up with Vision Zero. This is really about deepening the commitment to Vision Zero. Um, and, you know, I'm proud of this bill. I think it's going to really revolutionize the streets of New York City and it's going to change the future of New York for decades and decades to come. Matt? Oh, I don't know. I mean, uh, I, I, you know, I wasn't involved in all those negotiations. The staff was with the with the sponsor of the bill. Down the road. Uh, I mean, I, I potentially, but I don't think so. I mean, that's not. We passed a bill. I'm not going to walk back that bill today. You know, the the sponsor got a lot of sponsors. You know, the the body's voting on it. So on the day we're doing that, I'm not going to hypothesize about sometime in the future we're going to move that. I mean, I'm proud of this package of animal bills we're doing today. And, and just second. I think it's a case by case scenario. You know, right now we don't allow um, shark fins. We don't allow beluga caviar. Um, California, which is the seventh largest economy in the world, just banned foie gras and it held up in court. Germany has banned foie gras. And so I think it's a case by case scenario. But I think we always have to be striving to be more humane in how we treat animals both domestic animals and exotic animals, and what we do, and I'm a very, very proud and passionate animal lover. So you guys allow uh, factory farming for you did this pretty cool demonstration you were having there, going out there and uh, You know, it, I think force feeding is a thing on its own um, that is particularly egregious, and um, I think there's uh, a lot of consensus from advocates about how cruel that is, but you know, um, we can't solve everything in one day, and I think you saw we're passing a meatless, uh, Monday, uh, a meatless Monday's resolution here today, encouraging people to try to uh, choose other healthier options. But again, people have to make their own personal decisions. Uh, but in this instance, uh, the membership of this body and the sponsor thought this is the right thing to do. I think it has over 30 sponsors, and that showed the level of support in the council. Katie? I mean, the state of California, which is the seventh largest economy in the world, countries in Europe have done this. We're not the first people to look at this. So um, when you have the largest state in the United States of America decide to do this, and they actually had a significant foie gras industry and farms there, I think it shows that there's support. And I think that people's attitudes around animals uh, have been evolving to be a more humane society. And that means always looking at how we're treating animals, what we're doing to make sure that we're being safe and that um, we're treating them with the compassion and care that they need. When I was growing up, I never thought I'd be in politics. I wanted to be a veterinarian. Uh, my first job is I, I, when I was 14 years old, I worked taking care of uh, llamas and miniature donkeys and horses and Dalmatians. That was my first job that I had when I was uh, in high school. And so I'm a big animal lover. I've been my whole life. What? A zoo, I presume? It was not a zoo. It was uh, like a family's estate. 
um, and I worked there for the summer, and my job was to take care of the animals. I made $4.25 an hour, uh, and uh, I think I was working off the books. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm a big animal lover, and, I, and I'm proud of the package of bills we're passing today. <laughs> it was like, uh, it was like, you know, 101 Dalmatians. There were, there were 40 Dalmatians that I took care of on this uh, estate. They were Dalmatian breeders, and they had a big estate. But um, Katie, we can talk separately. Uh, Rich? The Salamanca bill? I'm happy that more sponsors have signed on board. I'm happy that you've seen a growth in support. I think a lot of that is because of the advocates and the bill sponsor who have been making the case. I've supported this bill for a very, very long time, but again, when there was a transition to a new deputy mayor uh, a few months ago uh, at sort of the end of the budget process here, we took time, both the, the sponsor of the bill and myself, to have conversations and um, I want to move this bill. We'll continue to negotiate, but we're not going to negotiate forever. Last question. Jeff? I mean, I think the food culture of the city goes beyond one dish. We have the greatest food in the world. You go to the North Shore of Staten Island and you have the best Sri Lankan food. You go out to Brighton Beach and you have uh, amazing Ukrainian and Russian food. You go to Washington Heights and you eat Dominican food. The food culture of this city is far beyond <coughs> foie gras. And that is the great thing. Of, go to Arthur Avenue, go to Jackson Heights, go to Greenwich Village. You find some of the greatest food in the world here in New York City. So I don't buy that this is going to somehow create the collapse of food culture in New York City. On the issue of um, the enforcement, uh, there is, and I think I said it when I spoke, um, there would be, uh, the bill creates a rebuttable presumption that any item with a label or listed on the menu as foie gras is a product of force feeding. So there's a presumption that if it's listed a certain way, there's, there's, they're going to be able to do enforcement. Um, you know, I think, like a lot of things in New York City, enforcement's done only when complaints are called in. Well, there will be inspectors in the I mean, there are health inspectors that go around and inspect right now. Uh, I can't talk to exactly how they do it. The health department could. Uh, I know the mayor supports this bill. Uh, but, you know, like most things, people come out and typically proactively inspect when there are complaints on most things. And that's, I'm sure, what the case would be here. I'll take Henry's. Uh, just yeah. On, on State Street, yep. just to put a button on it, yep. another really bad bicycle car accident in Southern Brooklyn, an hour and a half ago. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, could end up being fatal. We don't know at this point. But to pass a bill on a day like that, putting it in context, and I know you had your big State of the City speech and you laid out safe streets and much, much more, sort of started before the spate of cyclist deaths, but how much did the cyclist deaths make it push or move along this process? Well, in some ways, I, I, I wish we sort of got it done sooner, but we were actually trying to get it done right. We were working in a very thorough way with the advocates to make sure that in a bill of this scope and size, and it's going to have this impact for the next uh, seven years at least, that we wanted to get it done right. I mean, we announced this bill in March long before we knew how tragic this year was going to be when it came to cyclists and pedestrian fatalities. There has been a lot of focus on the number of cyclists that have been tragically killed because of traffic violence and crashes in New York City, but 
one thing that I think that has not been uh, covered in the same vein is the number of pedestrians that are killed every single day in New York City. We have a record number of pedestrians that have been killed this year. Pedestrian fatalities are up, I think, almost 30%. And the focus has been on cyclists, which is good, but it's about cyclists and pedestrians. It's about everyone who needs to use our streets in a safe way. So I am so sorry to hear about this crash in uh, South Brooklyn. Um, and, uh, you know, some of the heroes that helped us get here are the folks at Families for Safe Streets who, through unimaginable grief, and pain have risen up to advocate for safe streets so that no other person has to live through losing a son, a daughter, a partner, a husband, a wife, a loved one. And we're doing this to make sure that we really cut down on traffic violence in New York City. Thank you very much. That was, I did do off topic. Yeah, you have a question. Uh, I took a lot of, there, were, there weren't any, off, people didn't Salamanca know? Salamanca was off topic, that's not off today. The monitor. the monitor is Chuck Davis, who's the chief compliance officer here at the city council. It went through a separate committee, it wasn't heard at the same time, um, and it's still, it's, it, it's, 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 it's still going through the legislative process. Sean. It's appalling, it's unacceptable. The city's uh, Commission on Human Rights uh, should look into this. I am heartbroken to hear about how this young boy was treated at this school, and uh, no one should be treated that way uh, in New York City because of uh, their hair. It's been talked about before. Okay, that's what, that's what I'm doing. I just said it's Chuck Davis. Oh, a cost. Oh, no, no. Right now, it's a temporary monitor who is internal, who's already being, is an employee at the council, and we have not found an outside monitor yet. Uh, that's going to be part of the conversations to have. It's not going to be an easy job uh, to find someone who's going to want to do that job, which means that they're going to have to be compensated. We don't know what that's going to look like yet. We have to figure out what the person's professional skills are. We have to see what their time commitment is. So that will be a process once we actually can find someone and there'll be a negotiation with the general counsel's office and the potential monitor, but we don't have anyone at this point. So in the meantime, we're using our chief compliance officer, Chuck Davis, who was involved in the investigation, and he has been at Councilmember King's office uh, the last two days, uh, starting as a monitor while Councilmember King is suspended. Okay. What was the name of the llama farm? It wasn't a farm, it was someone's house. <laughs> okay, goodbye.